If I could have your attention, please, everybody, we'll just uh, inter get the keynote started here. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Kathleen Buse. Starting at Kodak as an engineer, Dr. Kathleen Buse has worked in various technical and management roles over the past 25 years, more than 25 years. <laughs> I'm really old. I know. <laughs> she really wanted that uh, qualifier in there. Sorry. <laughs> Her second career has been as a researcher and an advocate for women. This has been framed by her practical experience in technology-driven and male-dominated organizations. Dr. Buse's unique research has focuses on understanding the complex factors involved with retaining and advancing women, especially in the STEM professions. She's dedicated to improving the representation of women in leadership, especially. Dr. Buse has her PhD from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and is an alumna of RIT. She got her master's in electrical engineering here. And we're happy to have her back on campus. It's been a while, so it's fantastic. And you're reconnecting with some of the engineering folks, so that's great. She is the founder and CEO of Advancing Women in STEM, an organization that provides executive strategies for the retention and advancement of women. And she works at Case Western as the faculty director of the La Leadership Lab for Women in STEM. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Buse. Thanks, Kate. I wore the wrong outfit because I have to hold two microphones, so, <laughs> and the, do the clicker. But it's okay because I look good, don't I? <laughs> okay, let's get past that. Um, you'll hear me talk about looks later, and that's why I said that. It is so wonderful to be back in Rochester and actually to have a sunny day because I know how rare that is here. Um, but I live in Cleveland now, which isn't any different. But it, it's great to be here, and it's great to be back on the campus, and it's changed so much. And thank you all for being here. Um, we have a great uh, group of women, and I can't wait to uh, talk about this subject because what you're going to hear me say is gender impacts everything that's going on about you. And the more that we talk about this, the more that we bring it to the surface, and the more we understand it, the way we can change it. So let's go through the, the program. So what we're going to talk about today is recognizing the value of gender diversity. I have a lot of information on the business case for gender, gender equality, actually, really. Um, understanding what do I mean by second generation gender bias? Have you heard this term before? All right, good. I was hoping that because it's a basic primer on it. Um, I'm going to talk about how that's impacting you as a woman in your organization and also probably in life as well. And then we're going to end with strategies for both you as an individual, but also things that you could bring to your organization to, to make an impact on this. So we're going to start with an exercise. Oh, and by the way, what I want to say about this presentation is everything that I'm saying today is based in solid uh, groundbreaking research. Most of it is not my own, I'll highlight my own, but other researchers that have looked at this issue of, of women in leadership. So everything is research-based and focusing on strategies. I would love that you interrupted me if I'm not making sense to you or if I'm talking too fast or you, you have a question about what's going on, so please interrupt me. So, but first, let's do the exercise. So on every single table, there is a sheet with a word or two words or whatever. I would like you all individually to write, what did I say, um, at least 10 descriptors that come to your mind about that word, okay? Quietly do this, individually write 10 descriptors. No copying, ladies. <laughs> no cheating. Quietly, do it, do it individually. No, do it individually. Yeah, I want you to put your own thoughts down. We're going to combine it later. We're just ahead of the curve over there. First thing that comes to mind, images, descriptors, words, adjectives, adverbs, whatever you want to use. The competitive people already have 20 written. <laughs> the collaborative people are making sure that they're not offensive and they're really thinking about what words to say, but really I just want what's on the top of your head. <laughs> Sorry. 
When you're ready as a group, I'd like you to discuss it. Now you can collaborate. Okay, I, yeah. <laughs> okay, she's bragging over there because she is 23. All right, so what I'd like you to do now <laughs> is get together as a table and agree on five descriptors that you can share with us later on. Okay, so let's take a couple minutes to agree on descriptors. Oh, you guys are done already. Woohoo! We put down our top five. Great. Good, 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 good. Okay. Okay, I'm going to give the one minute warning. One minute. One minute. You guys all set? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. How many do we need? Well, you have to leave if you don't have five. I'm kidding. It was a joke. <laughs> I'd like you to have five. <laughs> You guys are overachievers. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Are we ready to move on? We ready to move on? All right. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. So, the impact of women leaders. I found this quote in Forbes recently, and I just thought I'd start with this. You guys already know this, but other people are saying it. So, there's irrefutable, verifiable research that shows women in greater than token proportions really are impacting the world as leaders. Okay, and Forbes said it, and they had a whole uh, string of articles about women. Um, does anybody not agree with this here? Okay, we know it's true, right? <laughs> we know we run the world. L let me just go over some of the things that, the research on this, because when I started doing this work in 2008, I'm like, we have to have a business case for this, and I, and I realized that it, the data really does exist. So. Women have a huge impact on societies where they're equally or close to equally being represented. And Christine Lagarde, who is the um, head of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, they released a port last fall that talked about if women were equal, equally represented in different economies, the impact on GDP that that would have. So for the US, 
If women were working in equal proportions as men, and right now it's about 47% of the workplace is men, or I'm sorry, is women, uh, we're not at 50% yet, but if we had as many women in the workplace as men, our GDP would go up by 5%. And for countries like Japan, where they've really struggled with their economy over the years, if they were able to get more women in the workplace, their GDP would increase by 9%. So you can see the numbers up here of some of the other countries. So there's a societal impact um, having women in, 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 um, in the workforce. And there's plenty of other research out there that backs this up. And you can see some of the studies that are readily available online. I'll, I'll provide some of this information if you guys want it afterwards. Um, some of the other studies, Catalyst, um, you guys heard of Catalyst, an organization that uh, focuses on women's issues in the workplace. They, they've released reports for the last 10 years that show more women on boards have more financial performance, that improve financial performance, especially return on assets, return on earnings, things like that. Uh, some of the other things that it improves organizational decision making, uh, more women in leadership lead to better re employee retention and um, better problem solving, and it, the list goes on and on. One specific study I'll call out um, was done by the London School of Business, and they had more than 100 companies, 17 teams, and they looked at innovation on teams, and they found gender equality was really what created more innovation. So having a room that was more like our society, where women were half the population, ended up in more innovative products. And, and a study at Carnegie Mellon University published last year talked about how women on teams change the dynamic of a team. When they're equally represented, they create a better atmosphere for everybody to be heard and listened. They take turns and they make sure that everybody is involved in the process. And they came up and they said that teams are smarter when the gender distribution is equal. So, what do we know about gender and Equality, we know that societies that have more equality for women are better off from, uh, from an economic, st econo economic standpoint. We know that women as leaders in business in improves financial performance of corporations. We know that women on teams make them smarter. And we know that women in leadership b benefits the individual woman. So why aren't there more women leaders? Huh? It's this thing called second generation gender bias that I'm gonna talk about today. And here's the data on women in leadership. Have you seen this Catalyst Pyramid? This is also available to anyone online, just Google it. They've been publishing this for at least 10 years that I can find. And you can see it, it, at the bottom of this, uh, women are 45% of employees in Standard & Poor's 500 companies. Okay, so they're almost half. But if we, as we go up the ladder, so to speak, the CEO level is still less than 5%, and this is data from last year. What happened? I mean, I've been in the workforce over 30 years. We didn't expect that we'd come into the workforce and 30 years later that we wouldn't be in leadership positions. What happened? What happened to me? What happened to so many others of you in the room or is happening to you in the room? I think we understand that more and more now. Here's another impact. Have you heard about the gender pay gap? Yeah, so, <laughs> eyes rolling. <laughs> okay, so it's different in earnings for women and men working full time. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes this data and they've been doing it since 1979. I'm gonna show you some data because I am a nerd engineer and I heard earlier they said that geeks don't have fun. I just wanna tell you that geeks can have a lot of fun. Okay, so the data is, again, women are 47% of the workforce last year full time and we earn 82 cents on a dollar for every dollar that men earn. Pretty pathetic, really pathetic, really disturbing to me. Um, what I wanna say is that the gender pay gap has improved over time. So when they started collecting this data in 1979, it was 20 cents difference than it is now. So it has, it has actually gotten better. And this is for all women. If we break it down by age, women who are under 30, 34, <laughs> sorry. Women that are under 34, have a closer uh, relationship to pay than the men. And something happens, like in the mid-30s to early 40s, that as it goes through, um, women in my age group are earning 75 cents on a dollar to every man. 
Okay, and we understand a lot of those dynamics. I don't have time to talk about that today, but it has to do with family, it has to do with caring for others, it has to do with stepping out of the workplace full time, but it also has to do with our, our internal processes on whether or not we, we ask for a raise, we negotiate for a raise, things like that. So over time, the pay gap has gotten better, but it's still far from where it needs to be. So one study tried to understand what's going on in the pay gap. This was published a couple years ago, and it, part of it has to do, about a quarter, has to do with profession. So I talk a lot about STEM professions, and engineering especially. Women in those professions make 33% more than women in other professions. So if you have daughters, call me. I'll talk them into considering engineering, because it really is important that you teach your daughters to be financially independent. So, so occupation, um, here's some data for you. Chemical engineers, average earnings, $94,000 a year. Teachers, elementary teachers, anybody a teacher in here? Do you know what they make? Average salary for teachers across the US is 54,000. There's a $40,000 difference between being a chemical engineer and being an elementary school teacher. And those are the conversations that we need to have with our daughters. Teaching's fine, but I, I can have a lot of teachers up here that'll tell me it's a bad profession, and I'll have a lot of teachers up here that can tell you it's a good profession. So if, if a girl is skilled in math and science, maybe she should consider um, the STEM profession. So anyway, I'll be done with that. The other part is industry. How many of you work in nonprofits? Some of you do. So nonprofits employ more women and they pay less than um, for-profit companies and ones that have more men. The other part of this, see how much is unknown? <laughs> Almost half of it is unknown. We don't really understand. So that women in engineering um, make more than other women, but they don't make as much as the men. So why is that? And again, I'm gonna come back to second generation gender bias. So let's share our words. So let's get you guys involved. So you guys had, who had woman? All right, let's start with woman. Tell us your five descriptors. Strong, leader, intelligent, empathetic, and organized. Awesome, that's really good. Okay, so who had woman leader? Okay. Um, compassionate, confident, energetic, ambitious, put together slash balanced, and we had a six, optimistic. Okay, good. Who had leader? We couldn't break it down to five. That's we okay, read them all. Like 25. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, proactive, good listener, lead by example, uh, communicator, uh, make the tough decisions, smart, charismatic, powerful, impactful, team builder, brave, organizer, creative, motivator, <laughs> confident, strong, share the glory with others. Okay, and what were your words? Compassionate? Um, confident, energetic, ambitious, put together, optimistic. Okay. What, what were similar between these two lists? Confident. So woman leader, leader, different words. Do you see that? <laughs> hmm, and then you're all women. Hmm, hmm, let's keep, continue this. Okay, you had artist, right? Expressive, visionary, flamboyant, free thinking. Like them. Okay, here's my trouble table. <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys have? I'll just read a few. We had women uh, Confident, creative, slash talented, inspirational, role model, and Beyonce. <laughs> Good. So, what was that category? Well, Beyonce. The category. Oh, they, they had women artists and they had artists. So, do you think there was much difference between the two? Can you repeat this list? Sure. <laughs> okay. Confident, creative, slash talented, inspirational, role model. Are they similar? I'd say they're similar. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, what do we have over here? What do you have? Man, oh, let's talk about man. I forgot about this one. Okay. Man, what comes to mind when you think about a man? Well, we have competitive aggressive, unapologetic, strength slash sporty slash athletic, and internally emotional. Wow. Oh. 
I don't even know what to say about that list. Wow. Okay, great. Okay. I'm going to just leave that one there. <laughs> Let's do programmer. Okay. We said male dominated. They're not people, people. <laughs> <laughs> they're technical, geek, or they feel like they're smarter, uh, logical and sequential, and they're compliant. Huh. Compliant. Interesting. Who had yeah. woman programmer? Okay. We had introvert, intelligent, independent, focused, and nerdy. <laughs> Are they the same? Very different, very, very different. So artists, which may be a female profession, similar words. Programming, not a, you don't think women when you think of that. Leader, different words. See where I'm getting? Okay, what do you guys have? A banker, what do you, did I do? Scientist, okay. Um, we're scientist. We don't have a scientist. Oh crap. Okay, well let's just do women scientists. That was my mistake. We have well-educated, smart, intelligent, methodical, organized, and innovative. Very good. I like that list too. Okay, so we have women banker. We have banker. What else? What else? Banker. Let's do banker first. put money, finance, generally men, wealthy, knows their numbers, works Monday through Friday, nine to five. Okay. <laughs> How about you guys? Where do you think? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we have bankers over here. Yeah, I have to say, you gave women bankers to a table full of women bankers. Oh, that worked out. So, okay. <laughs> so we wrote professional, problem solver, intelligent or savvy, oh, detail-oriented, and team player. Awesome. We also Ooh. said fashionista, but <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. You guys know it better than any of us, so. All right, and what, do we have any left? To, where are my engineers? Do we have engineers? Okay, what do you have? Oh, okay, do we have chief financial officer anywhere? Okay, let's do them first, and then we'll do the women. We've got male, cutthroat, smart, confident, educated, powerful, a-hole, pompous, decisive. <laughs> Hey, you said top of mind. I did. I did. I did. So, how about women financial uh, chief financial officers? Powerful, hardworking, assertive, organized, masculine slash frumpy slash wears the pants. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> okay, so what's my point in doing this? You guys are smart. So did you hear what she said? We have our own perceptions of what stereotypical or, or we're biased in one way or another towards our own gender. And I'm here to tell you we got to stop it. We got to stop it. Okay, so let's talk some more about this. But you guys did this exercise really well. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so anybody read Harvard Business Review? Um, they had a phenomenal article, and if you don't have this article, go get it. You can also Google um, educate everyone about second generation gender bias. They have a blog on this. So if you can't get the article, because sometimes they're really hard to uh, uh, get if you're not part of a, a library system. But anyway, they wrote, they wrote an article. I, I love these uh, researchers, Armini, Ibarra, Robin Eli, and Deborah Kolb about the second generation gender bias. I had read about it a couple years earlier because they published in the scholarly literature. And as soon as I read this article, I'm like, oh my God, that's my whole career. <laughs> it's all this stuff that goes on that we, that's under the surface and we don't really understand. So the reason they call it second generation bias was because in the first generation of women entering the workplace in large numbers that started in the 70s, there was blatant discrimination. And there were deliberate attempts and conversation to exclude women from leadership, where we know you're going to have a baby, so you can't you can't um, get promoted. They would tell you that. Um, the laws came into existence and it, they can't do that anymore, but that doesn't mean that they don't think it anymore. And that's what we call second generation gender bias. It's subtle and it's a barrier to your success as a woman. So I, I live in Cleveland now 
Anybody a LeBron James fan or an NBA fan here? Oh, right, good, we got some, okay, good. Okay, I love LeBron James, by the way. A lot of people in Cleveland have a love-hate relationship with him. But I was watching a game that he played in a couple, couple weeks ago, just a couple weeks ago, and they were playing against, I think it was, well, it was L.A., it was L.A. And um, Chris Paul, who plays for L.A., um, this woman, Lauren Holkamp, is a first-year NBA referee. So she's kind of like I was in engineering. She's one of, uh, I think, three ever women referees in the NBA. And so she, um, was, she, was, she wasn't taking any crap from the guys. Let me just put it that way. So Chris Paul was having a terrible game. Terrible, terrible game. And he was being really stupid and made some stupid plays, and she called a technical. And then he got madder and he got another technical. And then <laughs> I, I, he just blamed it all on her. And he said, well, this might be, not be for her. He took no responsibility for what he was doing. And he was saying that she, as a woman, shouldn't be an NBA referee because she called technicals on him. She had the support of her colleagues, but it still became a gender discussion. And if you Google Lauren Holkamp, you'll, talk, you'll see all these articles about, did her gender impact Chris Paul's reaction? Did her gender impact her decision to make a call? And she's phenomenal. She has worked really hard to get where she were, where she is and do her job. And all they're talking about is her gender. So ladies, let me tell you, your gender impacts every decision about you in the workplace. And you need to be cognizant of it. Um, this is what Chris Paul said. I don't think the technical was warranted either, but it's not a gender issue. He actually said it wasn't a gender issue. But I'm telling you, it was a gender issue. <laughs> Um, how about more bias in our society? And there's plenty of other biases besides gender. I'm only going to talk about gender today. But we know that the Academy Awards this past year of 20 actor categories, they were all white that were nominated in spite of the fact that we had a fabulous movie, Selma, that was um, just phenomenal, phenomenally acted. Lots of people should have gotten awards, but they weren't. What, what happened after that was uh, brought up by the press that that was an anomaly. We learned that 94% of the voters for the Academy Awards are white. <laughs> um, and Neil Patrick Harris had this really funny comment that we're here today to <laughs> recognize the best and the whitest in Hollywood. So, you know, he's calling it out. I, I think it's a great time to be calling these things out and it's good when we hear uh, about these things. Let me continue with gender bias in our society. Has anybody heard about the gender, uh, Gina Davis Institute for Gender and Media? You all know who G G Gina Davis is? Thelma and Louise, uh, a league of our own. Uh, she had a daughter, I, I don't know how old the daughter is now, pretty young still, and she, she was watching TV and movies and realized something's not right here. There's, there's, there's things going on that I don't want my daughter to, there's no good role models for my daughter. So she decided to start this institute and she commissioned a study where they looked at 120 popular movies in the past couple of years in 100 different countries. Okay, don't be upset about these statistics, but 31% of the speaking parts were female. But you know what, the world's half female. But our movies are not at all displaying what's going on with women. It gets worse. Um, only 23% of the heroes in the movies were women, and only 20% of filmmakers are women. <laughs> this is why I talked about what I look like. So <laughs> women were, in the movies, were more likely to get comments about how they looked five times more often than the men in the movies. <laughs> and they were also twice as likely to be shown in compromising uh, positions, wearing sexy clothing or, or being totally nude. Okay, so that's, that's our movie industry right now, very biased towards men. They also looked at the occupations of uh, people in these movies, and, and I won't read the statistics, but I put the reality on there. So for example, in these 120 top movies, only 7% of the lawyers were depicted as women. But we know from the data that in today's world, about 37% of lawyers are women, and about more than half of the judges in our country are women but we're only depicting them in such small roles in films. Okay, so these are the things that we're watching that we're seeing all the time and that creates this unconscious bias. <laughs> this is my favorite one to talk about. Have you heard about this study that came out about a year ago where, 
This is, this is not a joke. This was actually published by the National Academies of Sciences. So it's the highest top rated scientific body in our country. And they published this report because there was a trend they noticed that female named hurricanes were more deadly. More people were dying from female <laughs> Uh, named, and so they, they created all these studies, they did six additional follow-up studies where they looked at data, where they brought in people and they told them that Hurricane Victor was coming, would you evacuate? And they would bring in other groups and they would say, Hurricane Victoria is coming, give them the same message, and the people that were told Victor was coming, they were evacuating, but the people that were told Victoria was coming, they stayed. So as a result, three times more people die from female named hurricanes than from male named hurricanes. So our unconscious bias, you know, we had the male stereotypical, you guys did a great job of doing the stereotypes, violent, you know, I'm not sure what word you use, but violent and strong and aggressive and kind of, maybe kind of scary. So if I'm thinking a man's coming to blow my house out, I'm leaving. <laughs> But what, what, are the, what are the typical stereotypes of women? Soft, gentle, caring, weak, compassionate. I think that was one of the things we had for women leaders. What's that? Caring, yeah. So it violates our stereotypes, our unconscious biases. So we're not evacuating and it's deadly. So they're talking about maybe changing the way we name hurricanes because of this study and I sure hope they do. Okay. so. I've been throwing out some terms here. I just want to clarify what I'm meaning. So I'll, def I'll define stereotypes. We, well, you guys know what stereotypes are, right? Okay. Um, but second generation gender bias, I explained that earlier. Are you clear on what, what I mean by that now? Okay. The other one is implicit, implicit bias. And this is where the research started. And you can learn about your own biases by going to Harvard and taking their implicit bias test. Has anyone done that? Okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. So implicit bias is, is re really pretty much the same as second generation bi uh, gender bias. The other one is unconscious bias. And there's been a lot of that written uh, about that lately, but I, I'm, I'm sticking with the second generation gender bias. It's the same thing, it's unconscious. We don't even realize we're doing it, kind of like the exercise that we did here, okay? So what's a stereotype? Here's the definition, simplistic generalizations. You know, my, my husband is, is more kind and caring than I am. <laughs> and he's not at all violent. So it, these simplistic generations that we have towards a group um, really create the stereotypes. And for gender, it has to do with attributes, it has to do with differences, and it has to do with roles, right? We're the carers in our family, right? We're the ones that have to cook dinner every night. Where did that come from? <laughs> uh, I, where did I, or, or men take the trash out, where the heck did that come from? I don't, I don't know, anyway, another subject. Okay, so it's also about categorizing individuals based on these groups and the stereotypes, and we do that unconsciously all the time. And it can be positive or negative, um, but it's rarely accurate, right? Stereotypes are rarely accurate. One of the things I love to talk about, I played softball, anybody play softball growing up? Then we'd go for beer and wings, that was a great time, so softball. I had a great arm, and I always hated this. She throws like a girl because it's so demeaning, but I had such a great arm. This is one of the ones that I really just upset about. And so I talk about this with a lot of men, and I always throw out this analogy. Do you guys hear of Monet Davis? Yeah, she had like a 98 mile um, uh, fastball. And she played in the NBA All-Star Game as a celebrity. So she's a phenomenal athlete. Who wouldn't want to throw like that girl? Did you see the Like a Girl commercial in the Super Bowl? Isn't that fascinating? And it's so true, but the thing that we all need to do as women is step up and make sure that it's not a derogatory term anymore, okay? And we still allow that to happen, and I'll credit Sheryl Sandberg with really stepping out and say it's wrong, it's wrong. And it's hard for us to do, to say that being a girl is a bad thing, and men do it constantly, but we need to challenge them and get that to stop. So how do these form? How do these stereotypes get in our head? Well, it, it comes from a lot of different places. The stories that we hear growing up from our parents, our teachers, I think teachers, I know, I shouldn't say that, I know teachers are a source of this gender inequality and I'm working to change that and I hope you are too. But challenge your teachers. I, the lady before me talked about being bossy. 
Um, I was talking about this with a group of women. One had a six-year-old daughter, and we were talking about the bossy versus a leader. And it, it's really true that little girls who are stepping out and being assertive are told to, to quiet down, you know, act like a girl, don't be bossy. Uh, where boys that have the same behavior are applauded for their leadership ability. And I was talking about this in a session recently, and a woman said, I just got a, a note from my six-year-old daughter's teacher that said she's too bossy. <laughs> so we need, if you're getting that, make sure your, your daughter knows she should continue to be a leader, and that there is a ban bossy campaign if, you're, if you want to Google that and learn more. <clears throat> Okay, so that's where we're getting it. The media, I just showed you the overwhelming statistics that favor men in movies. TVs aren't any better. But then there's significant life events. Like a lot of things changed in our country post 9-11 in, in regards to our view on Muslim people. So significant life events that we associate with maybe a particular group create stereotypes. It's actually stamped or imprinted in our brain. And, and there are scientists that go into how this happens. I, I don't really have the time or the interest to do that now, but it really kind of gets ingrained in our brain. That's why we don't think about it. That's why it's unconscious. And the stereotyping is what leads to bias. And the bias is the part that's unfair. And that's how it's influencing you in, in, your, in your life, in your work, in everything that you do. Um, I'll just tell you a funny story. I was at the Society of Women Engineers. I'm a, the faculty advisor in case. And I'm in a room like this. There were, I think, three men, about 100 women. And I sit down next to a man, because it was the only seat. And we start talking, and I told him I was an engineer, and he was, like, shocked. <laughs> I'm like, it's the frickin' Society of Women Engineers banquet. <laughs> Why would you not think that I'm an engineer? You know, but you know, you think we, we didn't do it, but we have, I, I wanted to see what you would say about a woman engineer, but I guess you don't think that I look like a woman, I, I don't know what the guy's issues were, but so those things that we have growing up in our heads really create an unfair issue for us in the workplace as women. Because women who are leaders should be compassionate, but if I display, if I'm really hard on you because you didn't do something right, then I'm a, I'm a B word, right? Yeah, yeah, so. Okay, so let's talk about simple stereotypes. We did men and women, and you guys did a great job at that, so I won't review that. Um, but what about the racial ones? You know, we have in our head, what, what are, what are African-American women versus uh, women of Caucasian descent, um, Asian women? We have in our head these stereotypical ideas about what they are, and she's probably nothing like what the stereotypical African-American woman is. Or maybe she has some of those characteristics, but we're using that to judge her before we even she even opened her mouth. So the first thing that I look at, I, I make these unconscious um, um, decisions about what people are just because they look like. And that's what I'm telling you. People are doing that in the workplace with you all the time. Men and women. Um, and then there's more complicated stereotypes like a large black man and wearing a hoodie. You know, if, if I asked you to write that out, we'd probably have a lot of common themes. What about a woman in a burqa? What are we thinking about in our heads when we see that? We have stereotypical images coming to mind that I, that I just want to question all of you because it's really a concern in our country right now. And then, <laughs> I don't have time to get into all of this, but you add gender and race, you add gender and sexuality, you add gender and size, uh, religion, all these other things. You put them all together, and we come up with other stereotypes that we have in our head about what we expect people to be. Okay. And why is it a problem? And I think you asked the question in the earlier session about why is it a problem that I'm assertive? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to tell you why. I don't think it's, it's right, but I'll tell you why. So, in, the research talks about this double bind, or a narrow operating women, uh, window for women in organizations, where we can't be too assertive, because then we're bitchy or bossy, and we can't be too quiet or too timid. And I, I know the lady that was here earlier asked, how many of you have been asserted, told you too assertive in the workplace? Can you raise your hands? Anybody ever been told they're too, too assertive? Yeah, I'm in that category. Anybody been told you're not, you don't speak enough, you're not, you're not assertive enough? We have some. When I, when I do this with women engineers, almost all the women engineers raise their hand. They're always not assertive enough. 
okay? So, so there, there's always something wrong with us, no matter what we do. <laughs> because there's, there's this little narrow operating window that we have to operate in. And, and it's really funny, I was talking to a woman lawyer, she was a general counsel at a corporation, and she was told two years ago that she was too quiet and she didn't interact enough with people in the workplace. And that was on her performance review. So she made a conscious effort to be more assertive and to get out and talk to people in the workplace. And the next year, her performance review said, same, same boss, by the way, said she was too assertive and she spent too much time talking to people. <laughs> Uh, this is a true story, this, this act, and some of you may have the same stories in your head, but um, I'm telling you, you don't need to change to conform to what your boss is saying, and I'll give you some suggestions on how to deal with it. But the problem with this is that if you're too quiet, you're viewed as not competent, where a male who's sitting quietly working by himself, maybe looking at porn, porn on his uh, computer screen, but people think he's a really hard worker because he's quiet and he's not interacting with someone. But if you're doing that, you're not competent. On the other side of this, this and this is really, really the issue, um, if you're bossy or if you're told you're too assertive, you're not liked. And this is panned out all over and over and over and over again in the research, that we don't like bossy women. And I'm talking about all of you in this room too. We are unconsciously biased or maybe fully consciously biased against women who are assertive. We don't like them. I don't know why we don't like assertive women. <laughs> it has to, well, I do know why. It has to do with the stereotype. We're not conforming to the stereotype. And that's why we're not liked, and that causes problems down the road, which I'm gonna talk about. So I'm not telling you to change, though. I just want you to be aware of what's going on. No, don't, <laughs> don't. That's why I'm here. Okay, here's what happens with these biases. This is from the research that I did. Three things that I think are really important to all of us is we don't get the work assignments that are gonna leave to us to be achieving. And part of that is ourselves. The research shows that we negotiate eight times less often than men. So we're not negotiating for the right jobs, but we're also not asking for the right jobs. But beyond that, I'll tell you my own st story and part of the reason why I do this now. The last company I worked for, I had been there about three years, and I had a really great track record. I was, a, I was a leader in an organization, made a lot of changes, got a lot of stuff good. Oh, and by the way, um, everybody knew I was married, I have three kids, I talked about my kids all the time, and blah, blah, blah. So I figured, this was before I knew all this stuff, I figured if I worked hard, I'd get promoted, right? I mean, how many of you think that you, know, you work hard, you get promoted? Yeah, that should be the way it is. The guy next to me, Bob, um, came le in less, he was there about a year less than I was. He also had a working spouse and three children. And he didn't work nearly as hard as I did. And he, I can honestly say, he didn't have the accomplishments that I had either. And so one day we came in, this company didn't post uh, promotional opportunities. It was kind of like one day you were tapped and said, oh, you're promoted, congratulations. Okay. <laughs> so I came in and Bob got tapped, he got promoted. I'm like, wow, how did that happen? So I went to my boss and I said, Jeff, how come I didn't get that opportunity? He said, I didn't know you wanted it. <laughs> oh, okay, so I needed to ask you for it. Uh, did Bob ask you for it? Hmm, no, Bob didn't ask for it. <laughs> so there was this unconscious decision in his head that me, and I worked full time, me because I'm a woman that had a family, that I wouldn't want to be promoted. But Bob, who wasn't nearly as good as I was, <laughs> who wanted, you know, never expressed his desire to be promoted, but had three kids, needed to be promoted, right? So that's what I'm talking about. That's affecting you all the time. You're not involved with these decisions about what's going on. And so you need to understand that this stuff is going on all the time and that you can mitigate it. So work assignments is a huge part of this. It's a huge reason, that unexplained category, why women aren't in higher roles of leadership right now. And I can tell you this has occurred throughout my career. I can't tell you how many times I was told I was too assertive or I was preaching or I, I, you know, I, should, I should be more quiet in the workplace. It's just not me. I'm an assertive person and that's not gonna change and neither are you. <laughs> Okay, so the other part is being heard. For those of you that may be a little bit quiet, or even if you're working in a place where women don't comprise at least 30% of, of your company or the place that you're working, 
If, if you say something, how many have had this thing happen? When you're at a meeting, you say something and no one hears you, and the guy next to you repeats what you say five minutes later, and everybody says, oh, great idea, Ted. Yeah, it happens, it happens all the time. So that's the other part of this, is you're not being heard, because people are just you know, dismissing the, your abilities as, as a productive worker in your organization. So the, the second part of this, this affects our ability to, to achieve. So if we're watching movies or TV shows, or if everyone that we know who's a woman is not in a leadership role, it's, it's hard for us to imagine ourselves in those leadership roles. So this, all this unconscious bias affects our ability to believe in ourselves to achieve and really be able to take the time and say, I want to be CEO of the company, or I want to be on that board. Sheryl Sandberg, have you all read Lean In? If you haven't, you better get it. <laughs> She talks about sitting at the table, and I gotta tell you, as, as assertive as I was, I did not sit at the table. I sat behind the table, because I've been told my entire life that you'll be invited to the table when it's time. <laughs> but I, I wish she had written this book 20 years earlier. But we don't sit at the table because we don't believe that we fit at the table. And it also um, affects our ability to ask for help. We think we can do it on our own, and, and that's one of the things really I want you to take away today. You gotta ask for help. And that goes into the next one, is having supportive relationships. This unconscious bias that goes on affects our ability to have supporting relationships in the workplace. We all need supporting relationships in the workplace. And f especially if you're in a male-dominated industry and you don't have a, a table full of bankers that are women around you, it's really hard to find the support in the workplace to move forward. I was just at a session in engineering, and one of the young women, um, one of the professors was saying, she. She was told by one of her mentors, who's a man, that <laughs> um, men think of you as either their mother or your daughter, which they shouldn't think of you as your mother or your daughter in the workplace. They should think of you as your colleague or peer or your potential replacement. So it's, it's affecting those relationships. If they can't think of you as a peer because you're a woman, then they're not going to promote you. It also leaves out mentoring or sponsoring, the ability to sponsor. I, I don't mean to depress all of you, because I have some... <laughs> suggestions to overcome. So the first thing, number one, is we have to be aware of all of this. You have to understand gender is impacting everything about you. And it's not about fixing you. There's nothing wrong with any one of you. It's just about creating an awareness in yourself and understand how this bias is impacting you in the workplace and also to have a plan moving forward. So if you're aware of it and you understand what's happening, you can take action to make something happen. And then the third part of this is banding together in an organization, you can make change. So here's kind of my way of sharing this with you. I don't think there's just a really good way. So awareness. The first step is awareness. So as I mentioned earlier, educate everyone about this subject. What I, what I do is I, I share that article from Harvard Business Review with a lot of different people. And I should suggest that you all do that too. Send it to your boss, say, I heard about this today. Can we have a conversation about this? So making people aware that it exists. And there's solid research behind this that proves that it's true. But the other part of this is understand your own biases. Make sure that you understand what you're sending back to individuals that you're working with. And are you um, harder on women than maybe the men are? And there's a lot of research that proves that out. There was a study that was published last year. Um, Yale University did a study where they, they took the same resume. One was Jack, one was Jennifer. And the women that were evaluating Jennifer were much harder on Jennifer than they were on Jack. And they offered him $14,000 a year more than Jennifer. So these things, these things are occurring amongst women, and, and you know, at least you guys in the room know not to do it. <clears throat> So um, action that you can take. I'm going to step over here so I can read it, because I don't have this memorized. <laughs> Cultivate allies. Make sure that you have people in your workplace that are supportive. If you know every time you go into a meeting, no one hears what you say, pull someone ahead of time and say, look, every time I talk in that meeting, can you just reiterate what I said? So have allies in the workplace to reinforce you or to pump you up to make sure that, they, that, that you have support from colleagues in your, in your um, workplace. And use your network, use your, your female relationship skills to do that. Ask for help. 
I can't say this over and over again, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, but ask people to help you. They want to help you. They want to help you to succeed. And, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Focus on the purpose of what you're doing, not so much the relationships. I was talking to a woman a couple weeks ago who was interviewing for a new job, and she asked about how she could be sure that she has a good boss for her. And I threw it back onto her, and I say, why is that so important to you? Why are relationships in the workplace so important to us as women? Because they're not as important to men, and that's panned out in my research as well. So focus on the work. Don't focus on, oh, he, you know, he looked at me funny in a meeting, and I don't think he likes me anymore. We've got to stop doing that stuff. Focus on the work, focus on the purpose, focus on what's going on, not so much the interactions. Um, don't use being a woman as an excuse. I'm, I'm not trying to tell you that it's an excuse. But it can be a problem. But make sure that you're fully knowledgeable what's going on and use it to move forward. Um, build your skills. Things, sessions like today, I hope, I hope that you build some skills from this. But look for other professional and, and leadership development opportunities. There's plenty around from this school. Uh, Case Western Reserve University offers a lot of leadership development. I know my colleagues over there, they have leadership development programs. There's a, there's a lot of places where you can build your skills to, to become better at what you're doing. Um, manage, uh, manage your emotions. <laughs> so I heard the lady in before we talk about this too. I'm never going to not be emotional. I am never not going to show my face. That is who I am. That is inherent in me, and I'm not going to change it. And I, plenty of times I've had bosses try to fix me, fix me, make Kathy better, make her a better person. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I am who I am, and it's not going to change. What I can do, though, is manage my emotions. If I'm at work and I'm feeling really emotional, it's time to walk away for a while. It's, it's time to regroup, do something that makes me feel better about what goes on, and, and deal with the very difficult situation when I'm not feeling so emotional. So that's my suggestion. It's worked really well for me, and it works really well for the women that I coach. It's okay to be emotional. Just make sure that you're managing those in the workplace. And, and if you're highly emotional, don't deal with the subject. Wait until you're calm and able to think through it in a way that your emotion isn't driving your decisions. Uh, crap. Okay. Develop relationships. This, again, is easier if you're in a male-dominated um, environment. It's a lot easier for the men because they'll go golfing together or do weird things like go to strip bars and things like that that maybe you don't want to do. But cultivate those relationships in ways that you can. Uh, I, I, I was at a, a SWE conference where a young woman engineer was saying, all the guys go out to lunch and all they do is talk about sports, and I feel like I don't fit in. So what I suggested that she do, and I'll say the same to you, is, okay, so you're one of the people I'm going to go to lunch with. If I get to know you one-on-one -on -one and know that you're not only interested in sports, but you have a two-year-old son who is um, interested in something that I know about, then you have something else to talk about besides sports. So that's what I suggest, is find some connection. You know, we are better at this because we've been raised to connect with people. So find a way to connect in ways that are comfortable for you. Manage those relationships. Um, it's okay to question decision making if you're in a culture that allows that. So if you don't, if you're in a culture that doesn't allow that, find an ally or maybe your boss and ask about why decisions are made and how decisions are being made. And then the last one in here is embrace differences. Don't, we don't want everybody that looks like me, really. It would be a, kind of a drastic world out there. But we, the differences really make the team stronger. So instead of criticizing someone that might be different than you, embrace that difference and recognize that they're just bringing a different set of skills to the world. And I'm gonna like preach for one minute here. <laughs> and I love this quote and I also, um, if, if you haven't heard this before, Madeleine Albright said in 2006 at a banquet that there's a special place in hell for women that don't help other women. And this, I was reminded of this earlier this week because I had a, um, a, a woman who I thought was a friend attack me. We, you know, don't do it. <laughs> help other women. Build them up. If someone's attacking you, just throw sugar back at them. They don't even know how to handle that. <laughs> so, so be kind and good to other women and build them up. So for managers, how many of you have um, an organization where you're a manager or a leader? Okay, so this is what I recommend for, for all of you. Uh, um, 
again, become educated and understand your own biases, but you can seek out others who are different and embrace those differences and talk about why we need those differences in the workplace, that they really do help. And the business case plays that out if you need some of that information from me, I'll be happy to share it. You're in a better position to question decision making. So if someone says, well, we're not gonna promote her because she might get pregnant next year, I mean, that's illegal, number one. <laughs> but make sure you're questioning the decisions about if she gets, if she doesn't get, well, you hear it a lot of times, she just doesn't fit in, or she's just not ready. But question what you mean. What do you mean by she's not ready? You know, what, she's got five years of experience, she's done this, she's done that, she's done everything else that she needs to do. So question those um, decisions that are going on and understand that. Um, embrace the differences. Ask for help, the same thing as I, I said on the other one. It's hard for us to ask for help. Humble yourself and ask for help. Get your own mentors so that you can create a ladder and bring other women up with you. Um, the other part of this that I really love is setting goals and measuring progress. Make, if you want to have a more diverse team, the best way to do that is to set goals and achieve those goals. Um, so for organizations, I had too many, I had to go on another page. So for those of you that are leading organizations and can actually change those, I really recommend assessments, surveys, and measures, and I don't have time to get into those today, uh, but some of the actions you can do. Training is so vital to improvement. As a professional, I worked with some companies that continued professional development for me, and I felt like I grew a lot in those roles. Uh, other companies I worked for, they wouldn't spend a dime on my development. So if, if you are in an organization where you can create change, allowing people to develop their skills professionally in a setting like this or, or off-site somewhere really helps to form different ideas and change the rhetoric within the organization. So I strongly recommend the use of those programs. If you don't have one already, have a support structure in place where uh, women are not only mentored, but are sponsored. And do you understand the difference between a mentor and a sponsor? Okay, I'll just explain it. So a mentor is someone that can give you advice, but a sponsor is someone who can actually lift you up and help you to achieve your goals. So the research is really clear on this. Just assigning someone a mentor doesn't work, but if you assign someone a sponsor who's in a high-level position, that can change the world. Um, make use of employee research resource groups if you don't have them so that you can understand what's going on with the women in your organization or with um, a, another underrepresented minority. There may be some issues that you're not even aware of that, that are happening. I love 360 degree evaluations. It really changed my life when Kodak started doing that because I always had a boss that gave me his impression of what I was doing and usually it wasn't anything like what his was so I was always criticized. When we started doing 360 and you get a full spectrum of people input into what you're doing, the whole conversation changed and the rhetoric changed. So I highly recommend redundancy in performance reviews and in recruiting and also in the advancement decisions. Look for small wins. Um, you may not be able to hire 50% of your workplace as women, but if you, if you get one, celebrate it. <clears throat> and create an open environment, too. When, you're, when you have promotional opportunities, make sure that everybody knows what's going on. Google tells a story about how women don't self-promote themselves. We don't do that. And they, they talked about how in, at Google, they have a process for promotion that that's, can be either you self-promote yourself or your leader puts you in for a promotion. And when they first started looking at why they didn't have more women in leadership, they looked at the data and showed that women were, I forget the number, many more men would self-promote than women. And so they decided that they needed to talk about that and they needed to tell women that they needed to promote themselves. And just by telling them, completely changed the numbers around. So have an open culture, let people put themselves up for a promotion. That really has helped at Google. And, and recognize and reward others that do this. Are we doing on time? We're good, okay. So you've heard what the expert recommends. Can you add to this? Anybody else have ideas on how to overcome bias in organizations? Oh, more, I'll take a question, sure. So I am mentoring somebody who I think has potential, but I'm finding that she is her own mm. worst enemy. She will not step beyond her expectations of how a woman should behave in the workplace. Mm. And I can't, I can't get past that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's a good conversation. So did, did you hear what she said? Okay, all right, it's, it, that's real. 
it's real. And, and I would strongly recommend some professional development for her because it's not going to just be you that can change her. She needs to understand those messages in her heads and that they are limiting her. And she'll have to make a decision whether or not she wants to move forward. So we can talk later if you want. But yeah, she needs to understand that. You're absolutely right. We limit ourselves all the time. Yep. Other questions or input? Yes. Is there a program that um, create to make the men aware of their <gasps> Their actions that yeah. you know yes. to create more friendly yes. environment for the woman. Yes, she she asked if there were programs for men to understand this, and I can tell you that um, that's been my mission, not just to talk to women. And actually, I like talking to women, but I like talking to the men more. And they get it; they understand that they're biased like this, and they want to change it. So there's two things that I'm involved with. Um, we have a, the leadership lab for women in STEM at, at Case Western Reserve University. And we actually bring the leaders into that and talk to them about some of these issues. But beyond that, um, I've cr created my own company where I'm actually going into businesses and talking to the men. And it's been so rewarding for me because they, they get it. They understand that this is happening and they need to change it. Uh, are, are there others? I can recommend some books for you, but I'm not aware of other programs specifically that are uh, talking about this. But you're right, we need to change that. We absolutely need to change that. Other questions or comments? No. Other recommendations for overcoming bias in the workplace? Yeah. Dana, where are you, Dana? <laughs> okay, we're gonna do one for men, yeah. No, seriously, that's a brilliant. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I honestly um, believe that we as women need separate development because of what I've been talking about this whole time. And we haven't talked about becoming a woman leader like this ever in my life. So understanding that the biases are inhibiting you is a really important message for you. And I hope you got that at least out of today. But I completely agree that we should have conferences talking about this subject with, with uh, leadership, with men and women, with men only, it'd be really interesting. Because there are, there were, there, oh, there's just a new video that came out, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's talking about how the stereotypes are impacting our men in our society. And men are more likely to be in jail, men are more likely to be addicts, men are more likely to have mental illnesses. And because of the stereotypes, the violent, the gentle, be a man, man up, those kind of messages that are given, oh, don't show your emotions. All those kind of things are impacting boys and men in our society as well. It's just not my topic. I talk about women. But yes, completely, yes, yes. Good suggestion. We'll get Dana to do a man. Did you hear that? Did you hear the suggestion? <laughs> we're going to do, do a conference for men. OK, all right, I'm here. Let me know. <laughs> Other comments or? All right, I'll just wrap it up then. This is what I hope you take with you. Women are important in society. Businesses, groups, teams, you name it. Women are important. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. <clears throat> but everyone has biases. Every single one of us has biases. And we need to understand what those are. And we need to understand how that's impacting us in, in our views of the world. And these biases are impacting you in the workplace. <laughs> You're intimidating, but the guy next to you exhibiting the same behavior is a leader. So call it out. Make sure it's be being discussed. Make sure it's being talked about. <clears throat> um, increase your awareness. I I'll give you some recommendations on resources in a minute. But you can take action in your organization to make change, especially if you're in a leadership role. And especially if you're a very competent, capable woman, you're changing those biases in your organization. Your, your organization is going to benefit from understanding this stuff and, and moving towards improvement. Um, I, I started a business doing this last year, and I have too much work because everybody wants to retain their women. Everybody wants more women in leadership because there's a business case behind it, besides the fact that it's the right thing to do. 
So this, this is an important part of, of moving organizations forward. So here are two books that I love and that I'll highly recommend. Have you read Blind Spot? Anybody read Blind Spot? This is all about implicit bias. And there's really good examples and there's really good history and there's really good understanding of how it occurs. Not, not so many practical solutions. The, what works for women at work is really based on this. And I had this conversation just yesterday. Women, as women, over and over again, we've got to prove ourselves. So they talk about four strategies to be able to overcome that. So what works for women at work is a really good uh, primer for uh, understanding this and how it affects you and having some tools to move forward. Project Implicit. So if you want to understand your own biases just with yourself, it's implicit.harvard.edu. And you can log into their system and you can understand your own biases. And I know I have a bias towards people that don't have an education. I'm sorry if anybody in this room fits that, um, but I, I know my biases and I try to mitigate my interactions because I understand that I have a bias towards that. Um, so those are the two things that I strongly recommend. Um, additional resources, as I mentioned, we have this leadership lab. It's really for women in male-dominated professions. So if you have any interest, we have a kickoff session in April. Uh, it's been very positive. One of the things that I just love about, we, we had our first ses session last year, and of the women that took our program, within six months, 40% of them were promoted. And, and had to do with them articulating what they wanted from their careers, but it also had to do with them believing that they could achieve that. So great results for that. Um, I meant to bring flyers for all of you, but I forgot. So Dana's gonna send out a flyer so that you have more information on that. Uh, we also have a Crafting Your Leadership Vision. Um, uh, it's a one-day program, and that's actually today, so you can't really take that if you want. <laughs> but helping to do that. Um, I, I love Lean In. I'm a big uh, fan of Sheryl Sandberg. One of my things on my bucket list is to meet her one day. Another one is the Confidence Code. It goes into this belief to achieve, too. And that's my website, which is down right now, so don't go on my website. But it'll be up in about another week. Um, so I'm telling you, this is a phenomenal time to be a working woman. The conversation at the national and global level has never been better. We have phenomenal leaders like Sheryl Sandberg, like Melinda Gates, that, that have the resources and have the knowledge and have experienced what we're experiencing in the workplace, and they're working to make a change. So I've never been more excited to be a working woman, and I'm really honored to be here today. And I'll take more questions, because I think we have a couple more minutes. So go right ahead. Oh. Can you hear, can you all hear her? Okay. Oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. She's absolutely right. Yep. Yep. So yes, so all of you mothers of sons and daughters, make sure you're raising your, ch your children bias free or at least questioning the biases and, and making sure, sure you're aware. You're completely right. I've been talking to women like this for five or six years and I've just started to talk to parents because you're absolutely right. It's there and, and all the data supports your, yes, absolutely, yep. Other comments? Well, actually, my question was when you mentioned you have three children, do you have sons and daughters? Yes, so yes. Have you, uh, you're obviously you're aware of it in your mother? Uh, I haven't always been. I, I came from a very traditional house, you know, household. Um, well, not really traditional, but, but certainly my mother had a college education, but she ha did all the gender tasks at home. Um, I've always, I hate to cook. I don't mind cleaning, but I hate to cook. So in, in our house, I came in with all these ideas unconsciously about what I should do versus my husband, okay? Um, that changed completely after we had kids and how things hap uh, go. I'll tell you though, my, I, raised, I have a son who's 20 who cooks and cleans better than my daughters. I have a daughter who's 25 who's an engineer. I have a, my 15-year-old daughter will probably be a computer programmer. So as far as their ability to achieve in life, yes, I, I've raised them without bias. And my son is an engineering student at Carnegie Mellon. So, um, I will admit that despite the fact that I talk about this and he knows about my work, over Christmas he was 
talking about his friend, and he said, she whin he whines like a little girl, and I, I almost slapped him. <laughs> so as much of an impact that we've had on him, he's still impacted by everybody around him. And so I immediately took action and told him never to say anything like that. Why can't you say he whines like a whiner, or you know, he whines like a little boy? I, you know, I don't really care, but um, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I try to, I'm not perfect, but my husband is also, uh, he was raised by a, a strong woman, and he supports all, all of this, and he cooks more than I do. So I, I guess I'm rambling, but I, I, you're, you two are both absolutely right. It's how we're raising our sons and daughters. I see it all the time in the neighborhood that I grow up. Women, women allow their, their boys to do a lot more than their girls. They'll, they'll cook and clean for their boys, but they'll, they'll make their daughters cook and clean for themselves. So I, yeah, we, we need to change the way we're parenting. And Sheryl Sandberg, have you seen the um, Lean In Together? There's been a whole lot of discussion about having men be um, focused on what a good dad is about. And they're showing a lot of images. Dove has a commercial on, this is what a real man looks like, and they're showing a man playing with a kid. They're showing a man um, cooking dinner. You know, so so I, the conversation in our country is changing. But it starts with each one of us, yes, yes, thank you. Other comments, questions? All right, I guess I'll end it. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kathleen. That was wonderful. Yeah, that was great. So I have a suggestion for how to make them feel your pain. Um, when I, my daughter was about um, eight weeks old, I went on a week-long business trip. And I came home, and I, my husband greeted me at the door. His hair was sticking up. He was wearing old sweatsuits. He looked haggard, and he looked at me, and he said, I can't believe how much you do. <laughs> so just give him the opportunity, right, to experience what you go through on a daily basis. I want to take this opportunity to thank two special people that made today happen. First of all, um, a person that we could never have done this without, Kim Grant. Could you come out here, Kim? So Kim is our, the organization behind this thing, and she has been, uh, where are you? There you are. Come on out, Kim. Come on out. Take, some, take, some, take the applause. She's done a great job of helping us get our act together around this and making sure that you have all of the uh, materials and the room was set up and the great lunch. And secondly, I'd like to thank Dana Pierce. Get out here, Dana. Come on. Dana is a lifeblood at the Saunders College of Business. I can't say enough about her energy and her excitement and all the great things that she does for us back there. Um, I would like to uh, just have a couple of closing comments here. So full day, right, of ideas and sharing and new ways to look in the mirror. I'm going to leave you with two quotes. So the first one is from Margaret Atwood, and she once said, potential has a shelf life. Potential has a shelf life. So don't get to 30 or 40 or 50 and say, I woulda, I coulda, I shoulda. Take advantage of every opportunity right now. So as you enjoy lunch, network, and ultimately return to your work and your life, take advantage of every opportunity to make a difference. Leave your mark, right? We all have different ways of leaving our mark. Make sure that somebody says, wow, I learned something new or I experienced something different because I met her. Uh, Robert Fritz from The Path of Least Resistance had this to say, if you limit your choice only to what seems possible or reasonable, you disconnect yourself from what you truly want and all that is left is a compromise. Make it happen for you, right? So don't compromise, don't settle, find your power, your voice, and make sure you capitalize on every ounce of your personal potential. Thank you again for attending the sixth annual Saunders College of Business Power Your Potential Women's Leadership Conference and best wishes in your personal journey.